Okay, Peter Kalman here at the Organic uh, Center. Apologies to everyone that was trying to watch this on Zoom. We had some technical problems um, and still have actually. So I'm yeah recording now the um, basically the script and I'll make that available on YouTube. Um, Okay, so it's the Garden Eco Shed Workshop. Uh, it's all about how to design and construct affordable, low impact eco buildings configured to suit your particular wants and needs on a shoestring budget in the average backyard without planning permission being required. That's what this is all about. Uh, so, this process now I'm going to describe is practical, it's been proven in use over many years. No previous experience of design or construction is required to fully engage with this process, which I call living architecture. Uh, so living architecture then articulates the idea that eco buildings are an extension of our lives and can be regarded as being alive in themselves. Um, now this is nothing new. Uh, many vernacular building traditions throughout the world reflect this aliveness principle through their value systems by means of the cultural expression they inspire and by reference to invisible yet significant aspects of life on earth. So this is a thread that's going to run through this, this invisible uh, dimension, I suppose you could call it. Uh, now, this aspect of architecture, this connection into these invisible aspects of life has become overlooked in modern times because property has become the cornerstone of the prevailing economic system. And as a result of that, it excludes all these other considerations. And this then has resulted in the creation of buildings, particularly dwelling places, which are configured to rigidly serve the mechanical and technological way of life. Um, now, in addition to that, since the demise of the gold standard in the early 70s, where money was linked to the value of gold, uh, that link was broken, dwelling places and property in general have served as a generator of new money. So the mortgaging, the promise to pay back, the promise to work, to convert your time into money. Um, so this new money then is created as debt and the mechanical technological way of life yeah, requires that, the economics that support that require that in order uh, for it to function. Uh, now, this has been responsible not only for the insane rise in property values since the 70s and the consequent indebtedness arising from this, but also for the relentless consumption that this mechanical, technological way of life requires, again, in order to maintain itself. So this thread mill, as it's often referred to, has now temporarily ceased due to the lockdown and people are confined to the safety of their dwelling places to safeguard their mental and physical well-being and that of others. Now in many cases this confinement, this lockdown has highlighted the limitations of the architecture of the modern dwelling place in respect of dealing effectively with the impact of daily homeschooling sessions, home working sessions, home child care, home entertainment, along with the regular tasks of food preparation, rest, relaxation, sleep, and so on. Uh, so the resistance then to adaptation that such architecture displays, so of people trying to reconfigure their houses to deal with these new realities, um, very, very difficult. And this is a consequence of how these buildings have been designed and constructed. 
So essentially, they're designed and constructed to rigidly serve this mechanical and technological way of life, which, as we know from environmental breakdown, climate crises, and from our own innate sense of self-preservation, is actually threatening life and runs counter to the notion of creating dwelling places in the first place, which is to shelter and protect life, to provide nurturance and security to people, to facilitate procreation, and to provide appropriate context for the creative expression of our aliveness. So if we accept that the mechanical and technological way of life and the economy that sustains it is actually counterproductive in that it creates more problems than it can possibly solve in order to further its relentless growth. Now, that's very, very critical. It creates more problems than it can solve in order to, you know, keep growing. It's sort of monster quality. Well, common sense suggests, at the very least, the exploration of other ways of living that are more in keeping with natural systems and accord with the preferences of life on Earth. So such eco-living, as it's called, actually requires an eco-architecture then to support it. So this then is the purpose behind the Garden eco concept, to encourage people to design and construct an eco-building within the cartilage of their existing dwelling places, to facilitate the development of what might be called an eco-strand in their day-to-day lives. So rather than having to change one's living circumstances completely, you just introduce this eco-strand into your life and then you have a little eco-building that can support that. So then this experience of designing and making and utilizing such an eco-building It delivers not just a physical space constructed on sound ecological principles, it also offers a fresh perspective on life by harnessing our self, our sense of self-preservation and by suggesting new ways of engaging with the world. So how does this happen? It happens by the eco-architecture providing an appropriate context for engaging with the world. So a different context. So you can think of the building's interior more or less like a stage set that provides an ideal background against which to see and engage with life and the natural world as it really is. So it's a different perspective. Now, having said that, any eco-building, indeed any building at all, is really just a box, a context within which the process of living can be acted out. It's actually life that's complicated and, as a consequence, full of hidden meaning, which means that if the processes of living that a simple eco-building is to facilitate have been made conscious and have been refined down to their essence during the design process. It's these activities that actually bring the eco-building to life and indeed the person who's created it to life as well. So the building is just facilitating what's going to happen in it. It's just a box within which things can happen. But it's made appropriate to the things that are going to happen. So it's refining these things that are going to happen that's important. So it's by dealing consciously with the complications of life, by delving into our inner world. So what's inside us, you know, getting in touch with the dream of our lives, taking responsibility for who we are, and what life has tasked us with. This is what the eco-building can shelter and nurture. 
our own vision of ourselves and the life we have to live. <clears throat> so these are contemporary realities. This is actually what's happening now um, where the architecture of, you know, that supports people's lives is, you know, playing this enhanced role in their lives. And that's part of the evolutionary process of being human. So this is, you know, a change in our lives, uh, something new and something that requires a new form of architecture in order to, you know, provide the proper context for it to, you know, be lived essentially. And amazingly, you, you can do this, you know, all in your back garden. You don't have to up and, you know, find a piece of land, build an eco house and all that. You can do it from, you know, where you are. And uh, now as we move through the various stages of, of, of describing now this design process, I'll be referring to the handouts uh, one and two. These also function as worksheets. You can download uh, them uh, from sheltermaker.com and you can print them out and you can fill them in as uh, we go along. If you don't have a handout, grab a bit of paper make notes, but the handout is the best way to work. Uh, so the first part of this presentation will focus on design. And then I'll, the second part, I'll focus on construction. Um, so bear in mind, you know, what I'm presenting here uh, was originally configured as a two day workshop <laughs> based on over a decade of research and development and, it, you know, a lot of supporting work. So it's, you know, it's quite intense stuff. So, you know, think in terms of watching this several times and taking your time with it. Um, there's plenty of resources available on my website, sheltermaker.com, uh, that can be freely downloaded. Uh, so I want to say a little bit about architecture in general before I get into the uh, design system. Yet buildings are mostly made of immaterial space. So this is sectioned off from universal space with material objects, walls, floors, and a roof. And as a result of that, you get an inside space and an outside space. But both those spaces are connected to each other and are connected to you know, what we would call universal space. So these are the eternities that, you know, we learn about. Uh, space is boundless, time is boundless, space and time are conjunct. Uh, so what we're doing by making buildings is we're sectioning off a portion of this eternity and scaling it down to a human scale. But nonetheless, you know, they are boundless entities at uh, the space and the time. So this configuration of a space, you know, bounded by a material exterior, it really replicates the human condition insofar as, yes, we have material bodies, you know, which bound this invisible inner world we all have, our dreams, our imaginations, our personalities, our emotions, so on. So it's this similarity then between people and buildings that allows us to see ourselves in the eco building design and construction you know, process. And it's this then that offers us the potential to create a context wherein one can, wherein one can be oneself and further one's inner ambitions and dreams, particularly in respect of living in harmony with the natural world and the, in the exploration of new ways of, of being. So, you know, the design of the building is almost the design of ourselves. It's allowing us to create a context where, where you know, we can change our perspective. We can change our position relative to the world and our relationship with the world. Um, so then a primary aim of the design process is to manage 
the material and immaterial considerations you know before construction takes place we're not expecting the building to be you know able to answer all these questions on our behalf we have to answer the questions first allow those answers to influence the choice of materials the location of the building and so on and so forth how it's going to be made who it's going to be made by you know we're not expecting the building to magically somehow satisfy all these needs so this is what makes design so important and a lot of that design work happens in the invisible realm it's about how we want to feel or it's about our sense of you know what we need to achieve in our lives and so on uh, so in that you know process of inquiry yeah we want to reduce as many impediments as is possible um, remove those from the design and construction equation so that the final building can deliver on the promise of allowing a person to fully engage with and to live out vital aspects of their of their lives uh, so if you refer to your handout now um, yeah on page one yeah starting off yeah the first question is you know what do you want this eco shed for and uh, now there's a list of suggestions there art studio playhouse storage space there's loads of different things you can have you know a couple of different things yeah uh, there might be things you want to do that are not on the list write them down um, now this process of writing things down is important because it extracts things from inside us and gets them out in the open where we can see them so you know it's in our head write it down the bit of paper you get an objective view of it and you free up your imagination so that you you can make the most of it and i don't expect all the answers at your fingertips uh, the process of design is all about refining these preliminary ideas and answers until they exactly match the feelings that are encouraging you forward so it's you know it'll come out in a fairly crude form that we then cross out add in have new experiences have coincidences it'll add to the you know the the cleansing of the original ideas till it's right there yeah that's exactly what i want uh, so even a wrong answer is useful it's more useful than a vague idea or something that's still stuck in your head uh, and then taking your time with the exercise because time is a very important part of creating and experiencing eco building so this rush then to get it up that somehow then it's going to work yet yeah, won't work how you want it to work unless you've done this uh, preliminary work and that's a lot of the problems with you know standard building design yeah there's no thought put into it there's no connection into this invisible realm um so then with the writing down things uh, you can change your mind at any point you can cross things out you can add things in you can head off in a different direction and all that so you can imagine this as an ongoing process it's like a journey and intuition is your map and you're not certain where you're going to arrive but what you can do is because it's connected into life you can trust that it's going to take you somewhere interesting relative to who you are and what is in you that you want to do um, okay so we move on to page two of the handout how much money do i have to spend creating the building now you got to get this sorted right from the beginning basically cost relate to materials and labor so then self-building with help from volunteers is cheaper than employing skilled labor and i'll talk a little bit more later on about the realities of the skills you need it can all be very very simple the larger the building the higher the quality the more it's going to cost so even a building say of 10 square meters so that's like three giant steps one way three giant steps the other can host a range of activities you could even go down as small as five square meters um so then where is the building going to be located 
I'm going to be talking a lot about this location issue because that is, you know, where the space that's going to be enclosed in the building is going to be. And that needs to be examined very, very carefully. So I'll, I'll, it's going to be a recurring theme here is this location issue. So initially, just write down the back garden, piece of woodland. Uh, who's going to construct the eco building? So you might go, oh, I want, you know, somebody just do it all for me. Okay, well then your, your budget will have to be such that it'll support that. And also the whole experience of making it, it's, it's like a stimulus for our own innate sense of our lives. And so then your design construction time frame. You know, properly speaking, even though it's a simple building, you need to give it sufficient time. So in terms of where we are right now, we're in May. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be expecting to make a building, you know, to be ready for the winter or something. I'd be giving myself the time to think it all out, do all the necessary prep and be ready to go on St. Patrick's Day next year or something. Okay, we're on to page three now. Design intention. Uh, so this design intention um, is, yeah, the role of your building in your life. So that's actually inside you. Um, and it's this intention then that's going to bring the building to life. It's going to enliven it. And then the role of the building fabric, which is the walls, the floor, and the roof, they're going to protect this inner space and separate it from the outside world. So you're going to create this safe space. And that's what the boundaries of the space are going to do. They're going to protect you yeah, from the weather, from intrusion. You know, they're going to have a nice feel to them. They're going to harmonize with this outside, inside world. So they're going to be made of nice things. They're not going to be threatening your immune system or anything like that. So this clear intention is what brings the building to life. And essentially, it's that intention then that's going to control this uh, design process. So to achieve then this harmony between inner and outer aspects of the design, your mind, your mind has to be encouraged to share power with your intuition. You know, you can't just be using your mind, you know, to choose materials or choose where to put it or anything else. You have to get the mind to share power with your intuition. So what's your intuition? It's your feelings, it's your senses, it's your represented symbolically by your heart. So it's this head heart balance that has to be achieved um, and if you if you can do that which you really have to do um, it's like bringing yourself to life and the design will then will function in that way which is basically harmonizing um, everything so again emphasize the time element of it it's critical to allow time for this process uh, to take place, that you're not going to be able to do it on you know, the back of a napkin, boom, 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 there it is, that's what I want. Yeah, you can, of course, but <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it won't take you maybe where you want to go. So allowing time for listening, verbalizing, Thinking, feeling, experiencing, expressing, trusting. All of these are essential aspects of getting in touch with your deeper self in order that your eco shed can deliver the potentiality inherent with you. So this is the driving force. This is the life energy. This is what the building it is it's going to act like a antenna or something. It's going to attract this energy. And you're going to be inside it, picking it up. Now, it's also important to bear in mind that obstacles, impediments, limitations, and so on will inevitably obstruct this forward sort of movement. 
some of which will arise from surprising quarters. I'll say no more for the moment. I'll probably comment on this as we go further. Um, now, all of these encounters, be they good, be they difficult, be they challenging, will carry their own messages. So it's of critical importance to evaluate these honestly, stuff that comes out of left field at you. Like, what is that all about? Because they can deliver important messages in respect of creating an eco shed reflecting your deepest intentions. So someone might try and knock you off your, you know, trajectory because, you know, they sense you're escaping into some other place that they can't go. All sorts of curious stuff. So it's about being alert, about, you know, being conscious and entering into this other way of seeing the world and really of seeing yourself. Okay, we're on to page four of the handout, articulating your design intentions. Uh, so the environmental bottom line, very, very important to get this right. Uh, you know, what is your bottom line in terms of the environmental aspect of the pros eco shed? So environment, the topic of focuses on how really the building will harmonize with this living world of which it's going to be a part. This is very, very important, you know, to, you know, give yourself a bottom line uh, on the environmental preferences. This will affect the building's location. So here's that coming up again. Uh, the materials that are going to be used, uh, the quality of the air inside it, you know, how it's going to be kept warm or cool, depending on the climate, how the waste is going to be dealt with. All of these are influenced by environmental preferences. So you must express this early on. Then you can reference back to that if someone offers you, you know, fiberglass from a mushroom polytunnel. Um, you know, how does it accord with your environmental preferences? Uh, so this can be expressed in a simple phrase. Uh, so one I use a lot is, I want my building to be natural, healthy, and non-polluting. Very, very simple. So, you know, stuff to do with location, with do with materials, finishes, and so on. Is it natural? Is it healthy? And if I dispose of it, is it going to be polluting or not? Very straightforward. Okay, then next heading, developing a brief. So this writing down of things, it's, this is what actually called a brief. So it's a list of the criteria of what the eco building has to deliver. So it's like your, your terms, you're setting out. Um, okay, so you're, you, you, you're going to articulate now things about the building that you want to be a particular way, like activities. What do you want to do in there? You know, what is it for? It can be for doing nothing, or it can be for doing loads of different things. So you need to write those things down. Then furniture and equipment, what is it you're going to need to support that? And this is particularly important if the building is going to be small, loose furniture just gobbles up space. So you need to be building in or planning on building in things. So what is it then you need? Tables, chairs, if you're doing multiple stuff, you need good storage space. And then the abstract, what feelings do you want your space to have? So this will influence then the choice of finishes and so on. Uh, the feeling you want to have when you're in there, you want it cozy, you want it exciting, you want it, you know, calm, whatever it is you want. And then the surfaces, the finishes and the materials for walls, floor and ceiling. What do you want them to be? And then finally, here's the location thing coming again. Location, location, location. You know, this is why it's a mantra in the property world. Location, location, location. You know, where is it going to be? So it can be in a back garden or it can be in a private woodland. 
and there's um, yeah leaflets available on the parameters of this uh, that you can get from um, yeah I'll email them as part of the mail out uh, so you combine these answers but with the environmental bottle line stuff and these are going to you know they're going to guide things as they move forward you know particularly in respect of choosing appropriate materials and infusing these with appropriate feeling during construction so this then is the who's going to make it thing you know the feeling that goes into using those materials that you've carefully chosen it is going to impact the feeling that's going to be in that uh, you know, building this harmonization with the outside world. So how we look at that then, you know, the world as we know it, so there's, you know, five elements that make up the world as we know it, the earth, the fire, the air, the space, you know, which I refer to as space-time. If you have space, you have time, and water. And then there are four dimensions, length, width, height, and time. It's these elements and dimensions that we have to work through in order to create uh, the building yeah so earth for example all building materials including our own bodies um originate in the earth so you know the nature then of earth and earth mother and so on all the you know the clays the clay bricks uh, the plasters, the metals, the oils, all come out of the earth. So what's been that process of extraction? You know, what have they been subjected to? Uh, this is what makes things like trees so appealing. You know, they maybe don't grow in such great circumstances in some cases. Yeah, but create this awareness that the building materials are coming out of the earth. And that if we use those materials close to their raw state, you know, they've retained this earthy sort of quality. So how, you know, how do you actually evaluate them? You evaluate them using your senses, you know, touching, smelling, even tasting is essential exercise, not just in terms of choosing, but to make sure that particular materials might trigger an allergic reaction and, and so on. Now the issue of planning, this also falls under the earth heading location again. Uh, so generally small spaces are exempt. So when I say small spaces, anything up to 25 square meters. So 25 square meters is like five giant steps one way, five giant steps the other. Not a great shape maybe for building but you know six giant steps one way and four the other way so that's quite a you know it's quite a big building actually uh, so these small buildings then are exempt from the need to get planning permission if they are located behind an existing dwelling and now there's some exemptions also that relate to woodland management um, so we have a couple of handouts or a couple of flyers from the Department of the Environment. Uh, we'll put that link up and you can download that. And, you you know, there's certain restrictions, uh, but not onerous. Um, so here is again, location coming up again. You know, that it's, it's critical then to assess a proposed location you know, in terms of ground conditions, orientation. So is it going to get the sun? Can you pick up that solar energy? You know, can you access it with vehicles in order to bring materials in? Does it have a, a past history that might have left residues of, you know, disturbance there? I'll, I'll be looking at this a little bit more uh, also later on. Okay, so I've combined then the fire and the air. They're very closely connected. Um, so the fire then is an awareness of our aliveness and our 
conscious actions in terms of maintaining this aliveness, all of very paramount importance, the source of our life energy. So tapping into this and maintaining this flow of life energy is really critical if an empowering building is to be successfully created. So you see this theme in, you know, Eastern arch traditional architectural practice, the feng shui from China or the Vastu Shastra from India. It's all about locating the building and making it and orienting it in such a way that it has a good flow of life energy that you can you can tap into. So checking out location then, vit vitally important. So the fire and the air, they're really inseparable companions. Um, so the air supply to the building, you know, is critical really for people's health, you know, fresh air. Um, Okay, so then the breathability of the building is also important. It's very similar to our clothing. You know, wearing natural materials is what feels good in your body, like the nylon shirt or blouse, you know, in the museum now. They don't feel good on our bodies. Um, so, you know, making a breathable a building whose fabric can allow moisture to move in and out, very important. So it's these fire and air elements hugely impact then the choice of building materials, the building's location, its orientation, and so on. So you have to consider these things early on in the process. Now, electricity is also a fire element. So it, you know, provides energy. It energizes devices. Um, you know, but like fire, it has to be handled with caution. So electricity circulating at 220 volts or even 110 you know it can kill you and it can impact you in ways that you may not be aware of so you know you might want to you know think in terms of having a, a pv panel and just having 12 volt supply and so on well you'll get a chance to write this down on your worksheet um okay so some answers or some questions, <laughs> you're going to provide the answers. I ain't going to ask the questions. Uh, will your eco shed need a heating system? So what's your preference there? Uh, do you want to be connected to the grid? Or do you want to have, you know, a 12 volt, 24 volt system? Or do you want no electricity at all? And do you want your eco shed to be able to collect and store solar energy? And again, that will impact location you know, where you can pick up particularly the south midday sun. Uh, then on to space-time. So really this element of space-time, often referred to as the ether and sort of esoteric circles, of course, it's the most abstract of all elements because, yeah, we can't see it. So it's this invisible element. This is why it gets left out of most architectural practice it's not considered because essentially you can't see it. Um, but it is the elements that we inhabit. <laughs> um, so we have to find ways of evaluating the quality of the space that's to be enclosed by the building fabric. This is very, very important. So again, this is a location issue, choosing a space that's you know clean and healthy and energizing because a lot of spaces that have had a long history um, that needs to be acknowledged and you need to check it out ahead of time so that you're not in the position where you move into the building and as you go deeper into your inner world you, you, you're meeting up against you're having bad dreams or you're yeah there's something you're bumping into you know Again, this is true of the building construction process. If someone's left a bad vibe behind, you know, you'll be picking up on it and it can be hard to move through it. Uh, so any space can be properly evaluated just by spending time at different times of the day and night or whatever. Um, you know, bring a blanket out, bring a flask, sit down in it. Um, 
Okay, so then the dimension of time, this impacts a building design in lots of different ways. It affects the orientation of a space. So this is how the time elements or the time dimension, you know, is, you know, we can measure a plan. It's got a width and a length, but the time dimension, it's what way it's facing. So it, then it acts like a clock, dun, 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 the sun goes around it, so it might point in the south. Um, so if, you, if you're picking up the passive solar, yeah, you need to orient it in a particular way and you need to make sure then your location will facilitate that. Now the other aspect of time is this t creating this timeless feeling. Now this is very, very important. Uh, this is reclaiming of time because in part what we're doing here is we're finding ways of reclaiming control of our own space and our own time because what's happened in this mechanical technological world yet yeah, time has to be sold um in order to have a place to live so you make a promise i'll yeah work for 30 years i'll earn money i'll you know pay it back but that mortgaging, you're, you're essentially, you know, not owning your own space or your own time. And, you know, this is what we have when we come in the world. You go to a cemetery, there it is, born such and such a year, died such and such a year. You know, our time is our life. So it's Okay, so this timeless feeling, very, very important. And then the other aspect of time is the time frame for building. <clears throat> it's like anything to do it properly. You can't do it in a rush. You have to give the thing time. So, the, you know, the design time <clears throat> and then the construction time, you know, be realistic, apportion enough time to it. Um, so then the sensitivity with which the work is undertaken has a time dimension to if it's rushed and you're in there in this timeless or trying to get into this timeless zone, it'll bug you if you did something in a hurry and it isn't as quite as good as you want it. Now that brings up this idea of perfection, you know, which tends to be a part of this whole thing because what we're actually doing is like we're replicating ourselves and, you know, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we want to get the best of ourselves, but we are what we are. We have, you know, we've stuffed up. We maybe don't look like we'd want to look and this and that and whatnot. Yet this striving for perfection, you know, you see it in motor cars, you see it in houses. It, 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 it's a waste of time. You know, you, you just do your best. You know, and don't, yeah, you, you don't do it sloppy and you don't do it perfect. You do it as well as you can. You take your time with it. Um, now, this goes also to, you know, work persons, let's call them. Um, you know, people can leave behind the vibration, you know, maybe of resentment, indifference, anger. And you'll encounter this and have a hard time getting rid of it. So it's very, very important, yeah, to take time to get the right people. <clears throat> you know, so considering who will make the building, it's very, very important to be thinking of this right from the beginning. Because this invisible realm that I'm talking about here, it, it's really the repository of the unseen, the unconscious, the unknown, and the mysterious. So it's delicate stuff, you know, it, and it's personal, you know, it's personal. So the skills are not, you know, fast. You can learn them in a the day. I'll talk about it a little later. Yeah, so generally, to a large extent, you're going to be travel blind. You're going to be trusting to instinct, intuition, insight, guide you in a way so coincidences and so on are important to make note of them that you know coincidences relating to this you'll be triggering stuff you'll be dreaming 
you know, keep a note of what's coming up because this incrustation we all have is going to start, you know, it's like the dry weather. It's, you know, things are going to dry and crack and fall off and all that. It's like bark off a tree that's been cut down or something. If you don't have a location for your design, um, you can work away. You can create the ideal layout and then find the appropriate place uh, for it when yet the time comes. Okay, uh, so water then is another element that's, you know, part of the, you know, the, yeah, what we're going to work with. Um, so, of course, water is vital for life and the function of life support system. Uh, so, water supply to your building, um, generally called plumbing, and then the wastewater, it's consequent to that called, you know, drainage. So, what is it you're going to need in respect of, you know, plumbing and uh, drainage? Again, major impact on location. On the layout of the building, ground conditions, choice of roofing materials if you want to collect rainwater. And of course, water also represents uh, the emotions. So, you know, the, yeah, th this is going to bring up emotional stuff for people. Um, that's, yeah, important to work through it. You know, not carry stuff into the, into the building. It's like giving yourself a fresh start. So monitoring the feelings that arise as you move through this design and construction process, it offers an incomparable guide to whether you're on the right track or not. If it's all uphill stuff, yeah, there's something you're not doing right. Your aspiration maybe needs to be refined. So go back to your, you know, what is it I'm doing stuff. Um, Okay, so answer then the water question. Um, you know, do you, are you going to need water in your building? How are you going to deal with wastewater? And how does that relate to your bottom line? Okay, so those are the elements. That's what the building is going to be made of. And they all have vibrations. And, you know, the more work that's been done on, you know, some of the earth's, materials you know brings them further and further away from you know their original vibration so yeah raw clay then will be you know close to the natural vibration you know metals will have been through all this heat and so on and so forth um you know so touching and feeling these materials smelling them all of those things you know, you'll be able to evaluate your response because you're going to be, you know, inside them. So then we have the four dimensions. <clears throat> so it's this achieving this harmony between the five elements, so all the materials and so on, and the four dimensions of the world as we know it. Creating this harmony uh, is important right at the beginning. So this is where we can see that, you know, the sacred geometry and so on, the four dimensions um, have always been part of that, you know, traditional practice of architecture. So then transforming words, feelings, dreams, and so on into these four dimensions of length, breadth, height, and time, and choosing the appropriate materials. This is, you know, the key to the satisfying your eco building or your eco shed design ambitions so it means yeah you have to get familiar particularly with measurements because they're the common language of really design and construction i'll talk a little bit more about that now in a minute when we get to the drawings um so another exercise you can carry out on page seven of the handout is this design and style file so to begin to assemble photographs of small buildings that appeal to you, you know, pictures you take yourself or ones you'd get in books or magazines or online and so on. So start building up, you know, a compendium of images of things that appeal to you and maybe make a note. Why do you like that? It might be a color. It might be, um, 
uh, texture, something else. So pay particular attention to interior shots. Yeah, particularly ones illustrating compact or clever built-in furniture solutions. So we've all been on small boats or in caravans or camper vans. Yeah, that's so clever the way all that space is utilized. Well, you'll have to do that in your eco shed, particularly if you want to do a lot of different things in there, you know, built in stuff. Uh, so I would suggest then creating a file to keep your design and file images in. And this is generally true of what your worksheets and so on. Keep it, you know, organized. Don't scatter them all over the place. And then you can pull them out and reference them if, if you're inspired. Okay, we're on to the topic of drawing then. So this then relates to this uh, measurement issue primarily. Uh, so you can't, yeah, draw a building out full size. It's too big, even though it's going to be made full size. So how do you render the information about the size it's going to be yeah, you use the numbers, you use the measurement system, which you yeah, pretty much everyone's using the metric system now. Uh, so, you know, what's done there is you get a ruler that's essentially, you know, like 20 times smaller than the real thing. So everything is proportionally correct, yeah, but, you know, it's of a manageable size. So, for example, plans and elevations, which are what the building will look like on the outside, you know, they're drawn 20 times yeah, smaller, or if it's some particular detail, like a window junction or something, it's drawn bigger. Uh, so you get a little scale rule um, uh, to, you know, it's essentially a regular ruler shrunk down exact number of times. Uh, so these drawings then allow for the length, the width, and the height to be shown proportionally correct of a plan, of an elevation, of a window, or whatever. Um, but because these drawings are made on paper, and I would suggest sticking to the paper, even though there's all sorts of applications you can get, and you can draw it, and you can see it, and you can walk through it, the stimulus of drawing it yourself it's far better, you know, than all this fancy software stuff. Um, yeah, so the limitations of drawing on paper is that you can only show two dimensions at one time. So you can show, you know, on a plan, the width of the building and the length of the building. But in order to show the height of that space, you know, you have to draw another drawing. So that will show the length and maybe the height of the wall. And then to show the fourth dimension, of time, it's, you know, what way is that plan facing? Where essentially the, the convention is to show the north point. So at midday, the sun will be the Oxford place from where the arrow is pointing. Um, now these drawings, all they do is they show the enclosing fabric of the building, the surfaces of the walls, the floors, and the roofs. You can't represent the space on the drawing. You can't see it, it's invisible. Um, but you can use the drawings to make a model. Um, and this can just be a cardboard box from the supermarket. You just paste the drawing onto it. You can even cut out the windows and the doors and you can put a roof on it. You can see then the proportions of the space. You can look in the window, you can relate to it in all sorts of ways and you can change it so you're you're making the building in miniature before you're making it uh, full size and that will show up you know problem areas but the general theme is to keep everything dead simple the more complicated it gets the more time it takes and the more money it costs now you can also measure furniture and equipment you can draw it to scale and play around with it on your plan or you can even make little miniature things and you can move them around. You can do loads of stuff before the building is made. You know, so a simple plan then can be made 20 times smaller than the real thing, sheet of paper out, maybe tape it down onto the table, a soft pencil, 
don't be trying to make perfect drawings, you know, draw freehand. Uh, so for a 25 square meter building, you know, it'd be five by five or four by six. You can cut out your little furniture things. You can lay it in there and get a preliminary plan. You can, if you've got a location, you can enter that information. Okay, it'll face that way. So it'll be seeing this, it'll be seeing that. You know, you can, you can get a good sense of what's going to be like and you can change things. This is very, very yeah, important. So these are like dry runs. You're, you're, you're just getting practice. Um, you know, and you're seeing things you want to change and you can change them and it's not going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to cost you some time. You get the cardboard box for free. You better buy some band-aids too because, yeah, I didn't do it making a model. I did it. <laughs> I tried to open the door here. Um, okay. All right. So we're on then to, okay, making the thing real. You know, you're not going to make your eco shed out of cardboard from the super value. Um, you're going to make it full size. So basically, to make a building, uh, a structure. So the structure is what makes the building stand up. Uh, so there's basically two types. There's frame structures and there's solid structures. So a frame structure is like, you know, electricity pylon that's just made of small things connected together. And you can imagine then just attaching fabric to that and, you know, the, enclosing the space or a solid structure, which would be, you know, solid material, stone, concrete, blah, brick. Um, so those two types of um, structures. So frame structures, they're like our bodies, we have skeleton, we have our flesh attached, and you know there's openings in our our flesh for food to go in and waste to come out, um, and then that flesh is also yeah holding in our vital organs, has a circulation system, waste system. A frame building is pretty much the same. Uh, timber skeleton building fabric attached to it. Inside there's vital organs, the heart, the circulation system, heating and waste, and there's holes in the fabric to let people in and out, uh, to let light in and out. If you're having a fire, let um, chimney go out. You know, so these frame structures, they're versatile, uh, they're lightweight, so minimum foundations, put one on a sloping site easily enough, um, they're easy to adapt and they're ideal then for people who are not skilled uh, builders. You know, you can learn the skill very, very quickly. Yeah, so, yeah, the solid structures then, yeah, they're heavier construction, they're ro robust. Uh, ideally, then they need a level of sight, but they're more difficult to waterproof and slower to construct. And even a you know solid structure, you know, will have a lightweight frame roof on top of it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd be recommending the frame structure, if particularly if you're not skilled or haven't got a lot of experience and easier to make. Uh, in any event, framed or solid. Yeah, you, you can imagine the wall, the floor, and the roof elements of the building's fabric. I tell people to think of them like sandwiches, <laughs> like a sandwich. Okay, so the wall is, you know, one sandwich, the floor is one, and the roof is another. So let's say the floor sandwich, you know, is up off the ground. Um, it has some sort of, you know, bottom layer on it. It as much insulation as you can afford in the middle and then floorboards on top. So that's, you, you know, you go into O'Brien's and say, oh, I want a floor sandwich, please. And mm, I'll have a wall sandwich too. And would you like holes in your wall sandwich, sir? Oh yes, and I'd like a door and I'd like a south facing window. 
your outside of your sandwich needs to be waterproof. Inside layer of your sandwich ideally has some capacity to hold heat. So, you know, something like sand, lime, plaster on that inside, and then as much insulation as you can possibly afford. And then the roof sandwich, if you're collecting rainwater, maybe a metal roof. If you have money to spend, maybe like a slated roof. Again, as much insulation as you can afford and maybe timber boarding on the inside. You'll have made some notes earlier on about your surfaces. It's that simple. The, the fabric of a building can be very, very, very simple. As I said before, it's life that's complicated. You, you don't have to make the building fabric complicated. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, okay, so in its most simple form, okay, so you don't have a lot of money. Um, yeah, the timber is not super expensive. It'll be your insulation will be the main cost. Um, yeah, something like clay straw then is very natural, uh, very, very low cost. You, you could fill a frame with, uh, with clay straw and the sand clay plaster on the inside, the old fashioned Latin plaster, you know, the metal uh, sheeting on the roof, um, and then just simple, you know, simple boarding. Yeah, there's lots of different options and I'll, I'll be going into this a little bit more in the next session on the construction. Uh, so there's some questions then to answer on page nine. Uh, like, you know, what materials and products are available to you? Is there a local sawmill, for example? Is there builders providers? Um, and again, this question of who's going to construct it. You know, what's the best type of building structure? So I'd be recommending the frame, the frame, the frame, the frame. Um, so what natural materials are available to you in respect, particularly of your bottom line? And what construction skills do you have or what skills are available to you? Now, I'm, I'm a real believer in the volunteering and people working together. So people, you know, helping each other make their eco sheds. Uh, all highly recommended. Yeah, keeping things local, go to a local um, sawmill if there is one. You know, shop local. You know, yet yeah, get into this eco living thing, which is you you know about your local economy, really. Uh, if you don't have skills, um, is there somewhere you can get training? Now, the the method I've developed for framing, I can teach people is in a day or less. You know, so it's not onerous. The skills that are needed unless you're going to make something really really complicated in which case you know you'll have to go off and get a course somewhere uh, so then systems you know your electrical plumbing drainage phone internet yeah these can be you know the wiring and the plumbing and all that for those things you know can get added in onto a version of the plan and you know they may alter you know, the plan and they may alter the location of the building in the garden or whatever. So this is why everything is kept, you know, it can be moved around and modified. You know, we're not making a plan at the beginning, we're making a plan at the end. So this turns architectural practice on its head, actually. Um, you only make the plan after you've, you've kept moving everything around. And uh, then the costing issue, yeah, Notoriously difficult to deal with accurately. The larger the building, the more it'll cost common sense. Uh, a lot will depend on the choice of materials and the choice of how it's going to be made. Like you may have to employ a skilled person like an electrician or plumber or something. Uh, but a lot of the other work can be done uh, just by people um, helping. 
Um, so if you're to avoid cost overruns, you need to quantify things. In other words, you make an accurate shopping list. It's like shopping. You know, you go to your supermarket and you just load up with, and you go to checkout and you don't have the money for it. Yeah, you have to put things back. Yeah, if you're in the building thing and you're already halfway through it, you may not have that option of putting things back. You know, you need them. So you have to cost things. Again, this is the time thing, given the time, we're working out the costs. And, you know, what, yeah, like buying fancy windows costs, making windows, getting um, glass from recycled windows. But all of that, you know, salvage needs yeah, common sense apply to it. You can get offered things that are no good to you whatsoever. It might seem like they're good to you for you, but they're not. You know, so keeping things as simple as possible and yeah, keeping your building small and realistic in terms of your budget and and doing a costing, you know, based on your final design. Very, very important. Uh, if you're employing people yeah, you, you're not going to employ people on an hourly rate if they're learning how to do this. You know, you want a price for it. Um, you know, but a plumber or something that's familiar with what they're doing will go, okay, it's going to be X amount. Um, you know, my own feeling with this type of thing is, yeah, people should start networking and, you know, maybe the carpenter can go around and he knows how to do it and you know, there's ways of doing this. Um, okay, so if you're looking at building materials, you need to get price information. Uh, so then how, what instructions are there then for building, particularly if you're building yourself or if you're someone, even more important, if someone else is building what it is you want. Uh, you need what's called working drawings. So those consist of plans, elevations. So that's a view of the building from the outside. You know, the junction between the floor and the wall, the roof and the wall, how's that been made? Um, all, of, all of that information yeah, needs to be worked out ahead of time so that when the work has been done, you can refer to something and said, okay, it's done this way, or you're working a workshop, you're making up a window frame. And all that information then on the drawings can be used to do you know, careful costing. The building can happen very quick, the building process, if this work is done, and it can be done on the kitchen table. There's nothing worse than being out on a wet day, you know, trying to figure out how does the window, you know, sit into the wall or whatever. All that can be worked out um, literally in the comfort of your home. And then the building process can be straightforward. And as a result, then it's a nice you know, there's none of this, oh, you remember that window, it drove us crazy. Um, okay, now it's a bit of a specialized exercise, the working drawings. So you might need to get a technical person. Now I have developed a framing system and a set of working drawings to go with it that's mentioned there in your handout. And uh, we can you know, you can have a look at that and ask questions about it. Essentially, it's a simple framing system um, that, it, yeah, it's easy for people who don't have a lot of skills to work with. Uh, so that brings us to the end, really, of handout uh, one. Um, so we'll make another video now of the second part of this presentation that looks at the construction issues. Okay. Thanks for your attention.